Bye. Nice day, eh? I, uh, when I said that to a local guy in Jamaica, he responded with, hey man, we don't talk about the weather. And I said, well, where I'm from, that's mostly what we talk about. So nice day, eh? It was uh, two degrees this morning in Regina. It's supposed to be 13 this afternoon. For May 17th, that's a bit cooler than we expect. The normal low temperature is four, and the normal high temperature for today is 17. That is our mid-May climate. That's the weather we expect based on 30 years of weather data. Or you can know the climate if you spend uh, several decades in one place, just from personal experience. Like the farmer who approached me after I gave a presentation and he said, Dave, nice talk, but I'll believe in climate change when we get weather I don't expect. I remember thinking, wow, I'm gonna be quoting this guy for the rest of my career. First of all, he acknowledged my scientific talk, but then he said, he suggested that he would prefer to use his own personal observations. That's fair. Farmers know weather and climate. And the rest of us actually rely quite a bit on personal experience, especially when a problem is as complex and abstract as climate change. So what have you observed? Have you noticed an increase in the average temperature of the whole world? Probably not, unless you have exceptional sensory skills. But maybe you've noticed this. A decrease in the number of days every year when the temperature drops below minus 30. From about 20, more, actually more than 20 uh, days at one point, down to about 10 days per year now. Here's the actual data. This is from Indian Head, Saskatchewan, about an hour east of Regina. At Indian Head, they've been measuring temperature every, almost every day since the 1890s. This uh, red dash line highlights a value of 30. And the thing to note is before the 1950s, there was eight years in which there was 30 or more days of minus 30. Since then, there's been one year. One year of more than 30 days of, of minus 30. Our winter is getting much less cold. Now that sounds pretty good. Sounds like a good excuse to party. But before I invite you up on stage to dance, uh, let's consider the benefits of a cold climate. First of all, we have many fewer nasty pests than in warmer places. But the biggest advantage of a cold climate is snow, which is the natural storage of our water supply. So in the future, we can expect more pests and less water from melting snow. I see some nods, but you don't look too concerned about that. I'm not surprised, you're human. And throughout most of human history, we've been preoccupied with finding our next meal or avoiding predators. Psychologists tell us that our brains are hardwired to deal with immediate problems. Now that served us pretty well until we had the capacity to change the climate of the whole world. Now, our instinctive mode of decision-making is on a different wavelength than climate change. Unless you frame climate change as a catastrophe or a crisis. Perceiving climate change as a series of natural disasters aligns well with our what's called proximity bias. That we have this tendency to consider risk as being something that's nearby nearby in time or nearby in space. And we're pretty good when it comes to natural disasters. We make movies about them. We have, we're, we're fascinated with natural disasters. And when they occur, they come with the good news story of a community that unites to deal with the immediate consequences. We are more reactive than proactive. After a disaster, we tend to relocate in hazardous places. 
And we have this strange habit of whenever there's a disaster that reoccurs, we tend to refer to them as unprecedented, as if they never happened before. This is just a sampling of my large collection of headlines like this. All these headlines that have the word unprecedented. The ones on the right refer to the very dry year of 2021. So I ask you, are these floods and storms and droughts really, have they really never happened before? Well, that depends on what you mean by before. Typically, it's what we remember. Or maybe it's the experience of our family or community. But unfortunately, a human lifespan is a pretty small window on climate change. So in our lab over here at the U of R, we've constructed a much longer baseline of climate change and variability by collecting thousands of samples of old wood. In our dry climate, the amount of tree growth every year is determined by how much water was available. So by measuring millions of tree rings, we can determine how much water was running through the landscape of Saskatchewan. And this is our reconstruction of runoff in Swift Current Creek back to the year 1400. I thought somebody whistle. That feels good. The wet years are blue, the dry years, the drought years are red. So let's go right off to the far right. How dry was 2021? Well, you have to go back 260 years to find a drier year, 1760. So you can say, yeah, I guess uh, those people were right. That, that year was unprecedented. And what about these wet years that have occurred fairly recently? They were exceptionally wet. This whiplash between extremely dry and extremely wet is consistent with a warming climate. Scientists call it the amplification of our hydrological cycle. So we can expect more of this whiplash as our climate warms. But there's another daunting scenario that's revealed by the tree rings, and that's these blocks of red, which represent decades of drought. For example, the 1850s, when there was several decades where most years were dry. That's when the Palliser expedition came to Western Canada. And what did they conclude? A large part of the Canadian prairies would be forever comparatively useless. Now, I suspect you're going to notice climate change when in the future, if you're still around, we get a decade or more of drought, but in a warmer climate. That's when Saskatchewan will have a climate crisis. Now, I'm not trying to scare you. Well, actually, I am. I'm trying to scare you. Because I was told that a 10x talk is supposed to be motivational. Facts and figures don't motivate people unless you're a nerd. Advertisers know that. They exploit our insecurities, our vanity, our emotions to sell their goods and products. Now, I don't want to exploit your fear of climate change. Let's be optimistic. And let's imagine a climate resilient, healthy, sustainable community. I gave you a few minutes to imagine it, but unfortunately there isn't time to get your response. So instead what I did was I went to the chatbot platforms, Google Gemini, and ChatGPT, and I said, please create. No, I didn't say please, because they're not human. Sorry. I said, create 20 images of an idyllic modern city. And when these 20 images appeared on my computer, I was astounded. They had one thing in common. Here's six of them. These six and the other 14, there were no cars and trucks. None. Our collective imagination is stored on the internet. This is what we imagine as an idyllic place to live. But there's a complete disconnect between the places we'd like to live and the cities that we have built. 
for cars, not people. Regina is a prime example. In 2021, the city of Regina did a study of the use of private land downtown. What did they find? 47.6% of the land is used for parking. There are more motor vehicles in Regina than people. We incentivize driving, we discourage walking. Within three kilometers of our home in Regina, I can access my workplace and all the goods and services I could possibly need. I can walk 3K in less than 45 minutes. But I don't. According to Regina police, in the last 10 years, 35 pedestrians have been killed on Regina streets by motor vehicles. Well, actually, they've been killed by people driving cars and, cars and trucks. Now, if you think that a city with fewer vehicles, if you think a pedestrian-centric community is an audacious and, and utopian idea, perhaps, but it's not impossible. Did you know that in the city of Helsinki, one in three residents own a car? And it's a modern city. Downtown Oslo is essentially car-free. But we don't have to go to Northern Europe for inspiration. Here's a community. It's called Southwood Circle. Within a perimeter roadway, all transportation will be by bike, foot, and skis. And your workplace, restaurants, shops, and workout facilities will be within walking distance of all the residences. Where is this place? It's in Winnipeg. Go Jets. It's under construction. I love their timeline. They use tree rings for their timeline. Uh, and it's under construction. I know that because I talked to them. I congratulated them. I asked if I could refer to it in my TED Talk. And they sent me some images, some great images of, of Southwood Circle. So it is possible. Now, I've chosen to uh, target our obsession with driving for the purpose of this talk. But there's other ways that we can curb or constrain our consumption of energy and water and other resources. The solution to climate change is actually quite simple, but it's extremely difficult because we love our comfortable fossil fueled lifestyle. I know I do. But it's not impossible. We can take inspiration from social media trends like uh, underconsumption and slow fashion. And those, those hashtag activists that are, are posting uh, descriptions of what they're doing to consume less, they advocate things like cooking, wearing vintage clothing, hanging your clothes out to dry, gardening, uh, and my favorite, eating meals twice. Apparently, leftovers have made a comeback. Now, when I read this stuff, it sounds familiar. You know, a few generations ago, this was the way people lived, within their means. And they didn't seem to mind. They didn't seem unhappy, even though they had a lot less stuff. And one of my childhood memories of my extended family of farmers and tradesmen was that as they worked, they would sing and they would hum and they would whistle. Maybe if we learn to curb our consumption, whistling will make a comeback. You've been an attentive audience, so I want to thank you. <laughs>